Well, greetings out there on YouTube land and welcome to today's AmpFest in which we celebrate the new year by a double header of really high grade old vintage gear. First off, we're going to repair what is lurking under this custom made cover and I'm going to give you a little hint, it's an absolute gem. Then secondly, we'll be repairing a silver face champ. I know what you're thinking, who but your old uncle would ever put two gems in one video. But uh, let's face it, uh, that's why you're here, uh, for the best in youtube -dom. Uh So let's quit flapping the gums and get started. Well, it's time for the grand unveiling. Get a good grip on your undies and be sure not to drool too much on your keyboard, because here it is. A rare and wonderful 1961 brown face Princeton amp. Uh, I've never worked on one before, so this is going to be both an honor uh, and pleasure for all of us. Um, this is as nice as I think exists on the planet Earth. Uh, the handle has been replaced, but with an absolutely gorgeous, thick, nice one. And the grill cloth is perfect, flawless, as are the knobs and the control panel. Let's turn it around and see if that perfection uh, carries over to the rear of the amp. As expected, the rear of the amp uh, is of the same uh, extremely high quality as the front and sides. Uh, notice that the owner pulled all the tubes and wrapped them individually and also sent along the original foot switch which needs some work also. Um, he's going to want a three-wire uh, grounded plug installed and power cable. It looks like we have an Oxford 10-inch speaker and an absolutely flawless rear control panel. I should take a few moments to congratulate the owner on the magnificent packing job he did. Uh, the amp arrived uh, double boxed with about four inches of high density foam protecting every single facet of the cabinet. As a result, it arrived in just flawless shape and I'm going to see to it that it gets back to him the same way. Although I see none of the ubiquitous white specks on top of the cabinet, I was thrilled to find two big white specks the bottom rear. So the authenticity of this jewel is guaranteed. And it should be noted that the Phillips head screw set holding in the lower and upper rear panels are all uh, completely original, perfectly matched, and showing just the right amount of patina. It's interesting to note that in this particular amplifier, and perhaps the entire series, the tube chart is positioned uh, on the floor of the amp, not up on the side wall of the amp. Uh, I see no markings on here to give us an idea of the uh, chassis number or the date of manufacture, but uh, there's only one chassis, I believe, employed in brown face fenders, and it is the 6G2 circuit. Uh, as you can see, it's fairly uh, traditional. We have one triode of the 12AX7 up here used for the tremolo. Uh, we have a 7025 preamp tube that's split with the volume and tone controls in between. The second half of the 12AX7 is used as the uh, cathodyne phase inverter. And finally, uh, we have a pair of 6V6 GTs uh, in push-pull. Uh, outputting to uh, that 10 inch Oxford speaker. The traditional 5Y3 rectifier is used and uh, I see that the uh, 6.3 volt filament winding on the power transformer is not center tapped and they took the easy way out of grounding one end of it then running one wire to each of the tube filaments and simply grounding the other side of the wire. Not the best setup because it's uh, prone to create some hum. It's a cheaper way to do things, but actually not the best way to do things. 
It's also interesting to note that the 66s are not cathode biased, as you might expect in uh, one of these smaller, earlier amps. Instead, they have their own dedicated negative DC uh, grid biasing supply. And that supply is not uh, fed from a, a special winding on the power transformer, but merely uh, comes from one of the plate leads to the 5Y3 rectifier. If you're wondering how they bring the voltage down from 300 or so volts uh, AC, they rectify it here with a simple diode and then send enough of the voltage to ground through that resistor to tame the voltage down to the minus 35 volts DC that is needed. Any ripple in that negative 35 volts DC is smoothed by the 25 at uh, 50 volt uh, filter capacitor. And everything else looks pretty darned standard to me. We'll see as I get working. If anything else uh, pops up that's of interest, I will draw your attention to it. Okay, both the upper and lower panels are off now and we can get an unobstructed view of the interior of the cabinet. See that it's constructed of just plain old pine, um, probably straight from some predecessor of Home Depot uh, back in uh, the good old days in Fullerton. Okay, the uh, baffle is, has been painted black on both sides, uh, which is a nice touch, and has been embellished up here with what looks like a number 114. Notice that it also matches the cabinet wall, which means that this was probably cut to fit the cabinet, and as such, uh, they uh, are numbered so they can always go back together. Looking at the serial number, it should be noted that in 1961, Brownface Fender Princetons were numbered from P00100 to P00900, which would imply that about 800 of them were made. Now if we take 100 away from this, you'll see it's 473, which would place the manufacturer of this particular amp probably right in the middle of the 1961 production year. Also, you can see uh, vestiges of the box joints in all four corners, and they're charmingly imperfect, uh, telling me that uh, these cabinets were probably made in a garage somewhere with a table saw just the way you and I make them. Okay, I've unplugged that original speaker jack, and now it's time to drop this chassis and take a look inside. I should also say at this time that I'm always really flattered when somebody entrusts a just beautiful amp like this that obviously means a great deal to the owner uh, that they would let me uh, work on it they send it to me a veritable stranger uh, to work on it and as a result I vow with my scout oath not to screw things up okay well we'll see that said I'm stealing this jewel and selling it on eBay Okay, the chassis is out, and one thing that can make chassis removal a day in hell is when the uh, Tolex catches up behind the chassis and blocks its exit from the cabinet. So I think it's always a good idea to glue down the ends of these uh, flaps that go into the cabinet, glue them down securely so that uh, it makes the removal of the chassis next time a whole lot easier. And the best thing I've found for that purpose is a 3M yellow uh, super weather strip and gasket adhesive. I started using this on the old cars and it really works. I apply it fairly thickly to the back of the material, press it down, then lift it up, let it dry a little, and then push it back down. And look at that. It's, it's held down. Now you could sit there with white glue or super glue all day long and you wouldn't get that type of adhesion that quickly. When I'm doing a job like this, I always get a kick out of the uh, window screen that is stapled with about 9,000 staples to the ceiling of the cabinet. Now, my assumption is it acts as a radio frequency shield or barrier of some sort uh, to protect the uh, signal path within the amp from picking up 
uh, spurious uh, interference. Those of you who live back in the early 60s remember that in places like Mexico especially there were uh, AM radio stations that uh, had like 100,000 watt output power. I swear that I remember when I was a kid there were people who said they could pick up some of these stations on the fillings in their teeth. So I guess a screen like this made sense back then. Nowadays not so much. Okay all the flaps are held down tight and while you're in here, tighten these screws that hold the baffle to the cleats. Wood shrinks uh, over time and you might find these to be like a quarter to a half turn loose which could cause vibration and also cut down on the cabinet resonance so you really need to keep them tight. Be nice to have the original cover for the Alnico magnet on this uh, what I believe is an Oxford speaker. If any of you have one of these screw-on cans back here, the little screw goes right through the center, let me know. Uh, give me a price and uh, I'll buy it from you. Well now that the cabinet's finished we can turn our attentions to the bottom side of the chassis, uh, the tube side. And the first thing that kind of sticks out when you look at this is, wow, that doesn't look like it fits here. I bet that's a replacement. Well, if you thought that, you'd be wrong. Let's look at the number, 125A10B, and then we look over here at the uh, schematic from Fender, uh, at, made at, uh, in 1961, and we see that, sure enough, the output transformer is a 125A10B. The power transformer should be a 125P1A, and sure enough, it is. So transformer wise, tube socket wise, this baby is completely legit. And looking at that filter can cap with a 6119, it's very tempting to think that this filter capacitor was made in the 19th week of 1961. And as such, it's probably going to have to be replaced as is the original two wire plug. Now I'm doing this at the request of the owner. Uh, sometimes people like to just keep these completely original uh, but I believe he intends to use this amp and as such um, there are certain upgrades that are necessary to make this a good reliable useful amplifier and this is definitely one of them. Fortunately my high grade amplifier chassis stands uh, recently arrived uh, these were handcrafted uh, from lumber taken from the Unabomber shack and I'm counting on them to serve me well. Now let's take a drone flight over the circuit itself and we'll see that it is remarkably unscathed. In fact I see no evidence of any alterations, repairs or modifications. It's my understanding that the tremolo doesn't work well on this. One of the places to look is down here at this, the bias supply. Okay, that's the smoothing uh, electrolytic cap. There's the diode and there's the uh, dropping resistor. Uh, so uh, this is definitely a place that we need to address our attention. And also all of the coupling caps electrolytic uh, cathode bypass caps. The owner of this amp wants it to be reliable uh, and useful uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and so we're going to have to go in and make sure that everything in here is working just as well as it can and will continue to do so. Casey wanted to say hi to all her fans. Uh, she was spayed about uh, nine or ten days ago and she's still wearing the collar. This is the last day of it. I know she'll really miss it when we take it off but uh, she's doing great. Aren't you Casey? I'm having an internal debate about the two coupling caps for the 6V6's. They both have ideal capacitance, no measurable resistance, uh, they're probably perfectly good capacitors. Now if this were my amp I would leave them in simply because if anything fails, they are close to 60 years old, if one of them fails I'll know it and I can fix it quickly and easily. But when you're sending an amp a great distance 
to someone who cannot fix this themselves, uh, you have to take into consideration uh, that it might be better to replace them with brand new capacitors just to prevent a problem down the road. Okay, so it's really two different scenarios. If it's mine, I tend to be very conservative. Uh, if it's going to a customer at a great distance, you really have to think about the future. And it would probably be better to replace both of these just to play it safe. Here's an interesting disparity with the schematic. If you look here, the cathode of bypass cap is 25 at 25. And uh, up here, it's 25 at 25. But when you look in the app, the original circuit, they were both 100 microfarads, much higher capacitance. Uh, when I'm confronted with something like this, I tend to uh, replace what was in the app rather than what the schematic says and uh, see how it sounds. Well, it killed me to do it, but I replaced all three of the original capacitors with brand new ones and I'll be sure to include these three capacitors when I return the amp so that at a later date if anyone wants to reinstall them they can. On the cosmetic front I have removed the knobs. I'm going to clean uh, the area especially under the knobs and then wax the control panel, clean up the knobs and reinstall them. Okay now we restored a lot of the original gloss to the control panel and the knobs are shiny and new looking. Well I've unpacked the tube set which the owner meticulously individually wrapped in paper towels and baggies and find a tube set that is definitely up to the standards of the amp. RCA 5Y3, a beautiful pair of GE 6V6's a Sylvania and Amperex 12AX7. You couldn't ask for much better than that. All right, the tubes are installed, the amp is turned on, plugged into a variac where I slowly brought the amp up to full uh, wall voltage. Uh, I'm inputting a 500 cycle per second tone into the input jack. Uh, and uh, with the volume off, there it, the amp is absolutely silent, not one trace of hum. Let's crank up the volume and we hear the tone crystal clear. Pots are quiet and smooth. Now let's see if the tremolo works. We'll crank up the intensity to mid-range. I'm not hearing it start. Let's crank the speed up slowly. starting to hear it. Once the speed gets up to around 5, it starts to work. It's quite intense. Problem being that it doesn't start until the speed is at mid-range. Let's test that again. We're at full intensity, uh, the slowest possible speed. Oscillation again does not begin until up around 5. So let's take a look at the tremolo circuit and see if we can improve this. Now as far as the tremolo repair, I checked the capacitance on the three uh, oscillation loop caps. Um, this one was 20% high, 10% low, and 30% uh, high. Okay, And that, I believe, is, was the cause of the very sluggish and slow to start uh, tremolo. I went to my uh, cap stash and picked out uh, two .01s that were right on the money and a .02 and install them and let's see if there's any difference. Now if you remember before there was no tremolo until the speed was up to about five and a half and then it was barely audible. Let's uh, crank up our tone and let's turn our intensity up and already you can see 
that at one, we've got a nice strong tremolo. And it obeys the speed control perfectly throughout its range. So, the precision of the capacitors is critical when you're trying to tune up your tremolo. Now let's take a look at the 6V6 uh, output tube bias. Uh, the plate to cathode uh, plate voltage is 380 volts. So it seems a little high for this amp. The resistance across the uh, output transformer primary for the left hand tube is 151 ohms and it's exactly the same for the right hand tube which is very unusual. I've written it down here the voltage drop across that resistance is about 2.38 volts for the left hand tube and about uh, negative 1.72 volts for the right hand tube. Quite a and here are the results when you divide uh, that voltage drop by the resistance left tubes only flowing 15.8 milliamps which is about half what it should the right tubes at about 11.4 which is a little over one-third look at the plate dissipation six and four where we would expect it to be probably somewhere around eight or nine okay so obviously the plate current is way too low and that is why the plate voltage is way too high this is the resistor that controls the amount of negative DC bias voltage that is applied to the grids of the output tubes. So you can see it's supposed to be 30K. Instead it's 31K, so it really hasn't drifted out of range very much. What's happened here, I believe, is that these uh, two output tubes uh, have quite a few miles on them. And as the cathodes age, they cease to be able to emit electrons at the same rate they could when they were new. Um, so uh, the plate current then will uh, decrease. Now there's two ways to solve that problem. Uh, go buy a new pair of matched tubes or we can reduce the negative DC suppressing uh, voltage that we apply to the grids of the 6V6s and allow more uh, current to flow. Now in order to reduce the amount of negative DC that we send to the grids, we've got to send more of it to ground, which is at this end. And uh, to do that, we'll simply lower the value of this resistor. We'll allow more of the negative DC to go to ground, okay, and less of it to come up here and suppress the current flow in our tubes. Uh, so I'm going to hook a pot up, I believe, where this resistor is and see if we can't find an ideal bias resistance uh, without a lot of trial and error of fitting resistors in here. All right, I've disconnected the uh, 30K uh, resistor and wired in a 100K pot. I have the pot set right now at 30K, so we'll start off about where, where uh, we have been, and we can adjust uh, to get what we think is an ideal uh, voltage drop uh, across that uh, output transformer primary winding. And my guess on this is going to be around three and a half volts. Okay, so let's fire this up and adjust the pot until we get a reading over here of about a negative three and a half volts voltage drop across that resistance. Okay, we're uh, right where we were with the fixed resistor. Now let's reduce the resistance a little bit and get our plate current to come up to where we have a voltage drop of around 3.5. I think that's about it right there. Now we're going to shut this down and measure the pot resistance and then install a fixed resistor of that same resistance. Also, it's worth noting that our uh, plate voltage has come way down from 380 down to 348, which is a whole lot more tolerable. So it looks like this ought to be a pretty good setting. And the closest I can get is a pair of 47s in parallel for a total uh, resistance of 
27K. Now let's see what the final bias settings are on our output tubes now that we've reduced the value of the resistor in the negative bias supply. Uh, you can see that the voltage drop is jumping around a bit and that's because the tremolo is now fixed and the tremolo even though it's turned all the way down still alters the tube bias a bit. It's inaudible but it's still there. So uh, let's uh, say that it is around 3.4 say 3. Point. and our plate voltage is now around 362. The voltage drop was th minus 3.4 volts. The resistance of uh, the, the winding on the primary of the output transformer is 151 ohms. Therefore we divide this by this and get plate current of only 22.5 milliamps which is conservative. Multiply it times the plate voltage of 362 volts and we get a plate dissipation of 8.15. Now max for a uh, grid biased uh, tubes is 8.4 which is 70 percent of the 12 watts uh, which is maximum for 6v6s. If we were cathode biasing we could go for 12. Since we're grid biasing we have to go at 70 percent so 8.4 is the max and we're comfortably uh, just under it. Now since those yellow Astron caps were so out of spec on the tremolo I decided to check the uh, two coupling caps for the 12AX7s that should be uh, 0.02 and as you can see they are this one's 35 percent too high the other one is about the same so uh, I hate to do it but I think I'm going to replace them also and we'll end up then with every capacitor on this board changed and I've got to say in every case the change was necessary and now for the tremolo foot switch you can see it's pretty obvious what's wrong one of the wires has come uh, unsoldered from the uh, outer shield housing here of the plug so uh, let's let's rewire the plug okay let's test the foot switch tremolo is off tremolo is on off on I pronounce that fixed before we give the amp a final test, uh, let's briefly review what all has been done. Install a three-wire power cord, bypass the ground switch, and wire the primary circuit properly where the hot wire passes through both the switch and the fuse before it reaches the power transformer. Replace all three of the electrolytic filter caps and the grid blocker resistors for the two 6V6s. Next, replace the diode and filter capacitor in the negative DC power supply and then uh, carefully bias the uh, 6V6 output tubes to about 60 percent of uh, maximum uh, plate dissipation. Replace all of the coupling capacitors, cathode bypass capacitors, and uh, tremolo capacitors. Oh, and let's not forget the rewiring of the original tremolo foot switch. And finally, uh, cosmetic upgrades like up washing and waxing the front control panel, the knobs, and the rear control panel. I'm getting ready to pack up the Princeton to send it back home to its proud owner. And I just wanted to show you uh, the quality packing job that he uh, did to protect his amp while it was being sent to me. Uh, look at the amount of padding all the way around between the outer box and the inner box and there's even uh, foam inside the inner box then this double uh, thick panel goes on top of the amp that one goes over everything and then one a layer of foam up here on top just to be sure that everything's safe. Wow. I have to say that's the best packing job I've ever seen. Okay, uh, let's hook up a guitar to the mighty Princeton and strum a few chords to test the uh, volume, tone, and tremolo. Okay, we've got the volume set to 3 and the tone knob is up at between 5 and 6, straight up.
Sounds great to me. Nice balance between bass. Now let's try the tremolo uh, speed and intensity at mid range. Typical Princeton, just almost flawless tremolo. Beautiful. Uh, let's crank it up now to uh, maximum intensity and speed. Wow, sounds like a helicopter taking off. Now how about minimum speed and maximum intensity? Pretty swampy. Okay, time to put this back in the cabinet, put everything back together, and see how it sounds with Jack and Ollie strumming some tunes. Okay, here it is with the back uh, panels in place, We're ready to turn it around and turn it over to Ollie and Jack. <laughs> Also wanted to show you something really nice that a viewer named Joel Thomas made for me. Uh, he makes custom amp covers for any amp that you may have. In this case, uh, it's for a National Aztec, a rather unusual amp. I sent him the dimensions, and uh, in just a short period of time, uh, this really nice cover showed up in the mail. Not only does it fit beautifully, but if you uh, notice, he also color coordinated it. He picked up on the colors uh, in the original uh, Tolex on the Aztec and then duplicated it in the cover. Stitching is first class and uh, if you need a custom amp cover I think Joel's your man. I'm gonna put a link in the video description so that you can contact him and order your own. We just received this really nice clean 1978 Fender Champ. Uh, it has an open crack here on the left top front corner about two and a half inches I hope that didn't happen in transport the box looked fine the packing was good uh, I'll have to check with the owner um, the uh, all of these parts up here were uh, present when it arrived I removed uh, all but one screw to pull the chassis uh, to check it out okay the problem as I see it is this volume control is a mess. 
It's filthy. You can hear all kinds of popping. And uh, the amplifier portion is working okay, but this volume control is no good. It may just need to be cleaned. Also, I'm hearing a hum that is much louder than it should be that may be related to a problem with the volume control. Because the hum goes away if you move the volume control. Okay, uh, I guess it's time to pull the chassis and start checking this beast out. Other than the break in that uh, top front corner, the interior and chassis are in beautiful shape. Obviously a replacement speaker and probably for the better. Uh, somebody has fashioned a wire retainer here for the rectifier tube, uh, which doesn't really look to be very effectual. Okay, uh, let's uh, flip it over and see what's inside. I removed this homemade wire retainer for fear of what if it got under the tube like so and uh, bridged across a couple pins and shorted your high voltage or your 5 voltage, uh, five volt winding. Utter disaster. So this is doing no good and could cause a lot of... Before I start uh, on the circuit, I'm going to see if I can close this crack with a big pipe clamp. If I can, then I'll apply glue and uh, clamp it down and let it dry overnight uh, so that uh, we can resolve this issue uh, I think cosmetically very well where it'll be almost undetectable. There as you can see the pipe clamp can close it quite well. Uh, it almost disappears um, so I'm going to now uh, open the clamp, apply glue liberally and then clamp it down and leave it overnight to harden. Okay, I've cleaned the tube sockets. Uh, now I'm going to go in and tighten up some of these uh, recipients here for the pins. Um, th this, uh, this is the 6v6. It, th this base is loose. Okay, I, I'm not sure why they put the retainer over here, but because this socket's looser than the uh, 5y3 socket. To tighten up this type of socket, uh, you take a very small tip straight bladed screwdriver. Go down in there and pry the uh, holders closed. Okay, now they're kind of open like this and the pin just slops around in there. So you're going to use that screwdriver to bend them closed so that it, there's much more interference with the pin as it passes through uh, the little socket hole. Now the 5Y3 socket has been tightened up. It's uh, kind of ironic, we agonize over the quality of our solder joints in the circuit and then we take the most critical of all joints, which is the pin to the, so uh, to the socket uh, connection, for granted. Okay, so uh, really tightening these up uh, often makes a big difference. Right, we see that the circuit itself is uh, unmolested and really nice clean original shape. I disconnected uh, the death cap from the um, primary uh, wire here uh, and just laid it down so that it's still present. The original cap is present but it's not connected. Uh, next um, I'm going to test the ESR values of the electrolytic capacitors. The filter caps check out uh, quite nicely with ESR values of around 1.5 and below. I'll need to talk with the owner to see if he still wants uh, new filter caps. Uh, I believe these are serviceable, uh, but that's up to him. Okay, we see here from pin 8, which is the cathode, comes over here and there's the traditional fender of 470 ohm uh, bias resistor. And as you can see, it really hasn't drifted much over the years. And the cathode bypass capacitor, 50 microfarads at 25 volts. Uh, I'm going to check the bias. These champs are notoriously biased too hot. Uh, we'll check and see. Then while I'm at it, I sprayed the three pots, especially that noisy volume pot, with deoxit. And I'm trying to have it clean itself inside when I uh, rotate the wiper around. Let's hope that stops all that popping and uh, other noises. And then we can check the bias. Part of the reason I'm interested in the bias is it's obvious that this power transformer 
has gotten really hot over time. And um, that's a, a really a pretty good indicator that it's just flowing too much current. So um, I've got the tubes back in place into those Titan sockets. So let's flip this jewel over and check the bias of the 6V6. Since I don't have any 3.2 ohm dummy loads, I've had to jumper uh, the circuit to its own speaker. And uh, now we'll see what the voltage drop is across that 469 ohm resistor. I also notice now that the volume control is quieted down, that it, now that it's been cleaned. Uh, that's, that's nice. Okay, uh, voltage drop is 24.2 volts and the plate voltage measured from plate to cathode is 357.8 volts DC. Well I thought that that voltage drop was a little high and the plate voltage was a little low for a silver face champ and here's why. Look at the plate current. 51.6 milliamps through that 6V6. How about this for plate dis, uh, dissipation? 18.46 um, watts, which is what, 50% over the maximum? Uh, now, I notice it's an electroharmonics uh, 6V6, and I have a feeling that is the culprit uh, that is drawing way too much current. We're going to double check this, and then we're going to go back and alter the uh, bias resistor value, raise it way up uh, so that we can curtail this uh, outrageous plate current and plate dissipation. Let's test my theory. Pull the electroharmonic 6V6 and put in a, a good old vintage uh, Philco 6V6. We'll see if this one draws a lot less current. Okay, uh, the member of the voltage drop with the electroharmonics was 24.2 volts and with the uh, vintage Philco tube it's uh, 22.15 we'll say. And uh, let's see the difference in uh, plate current. Well it was 4 milliamps lower which is not as much of a decrease as I expected. So it appears we're just going to have to rebias this uh, to get that plate dissipation down to around 11 watts. All right, let's clip in a 1,000 ohm resistor to see uh, how that affects the voltage drop and the plate current. Okay, the voltage drop is now 31.8, which sounds higher, but remember that the denominator is more than double. It's 1,000 as opposed to 470, so the plate current has definitely gone way down. Okay, 31.8 uh, volts voltage drop. The actual value of the resistor is uh, 1,020 ohms, so perfect uh, plate current now, now is 32 milliamps. Let's find out the plate voltage and then calculate our plate dissipation. Okay, the plate to cathode net uh, plate voltage, 378 volts. You see it goes up when the current goes down. They're indirectly related. So let's go with three, 376 for a plate voltage. Okay, 376 times 0 .032. Uh, plate current is a plate dissipation of 12 watts, which is a whole lot better than 18 and a half. So uh, I'm going to stay with this. The 1,000 ohm uh, bias resistor seems ideal. Uh, I will go ahead then, instead of tacking it in, and I will solder it into place. So we remove the 470 and put in the 1000 ohm resistor, same size, uh, same style. Uh, actually, unless you can read bands, I don't think anyone would ever notice. If we go to 31 uh, volt uh, drop across this resistor, Having a capacitor across it uh, that's rated at 25 volts seems a little foolhardy. So I'm going to put in a 50 at 50 uh, cathode bypass cap. Okay, there's a new 50 at 50 cathode bypass cap installed. Um, things are looking pretty good. So even though the uh, original electrolytics uh, checked out perfectly and seemed to function just fine, I thought it best in the long run to replace the electrolytic capacitors, 220s 
and a 40 it's supposed to be I put in a 47 and that way we know this uh, amp is going to keep running electrolytic capacitor wise for a long long time well we got the little champ all back together uh, we've got it sitting here idling at uh, three and a half on the volume scale and it seems dead quiet to me uh, let's try that volume remember it was real noisy no absolutely dead quiet uh, alrighty uh, let's strum a few chords through this just to make sure that uh, everything works and then we'll turn it over to Jack and Ollie uh, for the final test <laughs> sounds pretty good to me. Okay, I guess it's time to turn this beast over to Jack and Ollie for a couple familiar tunes. That's about it on this double header video featuring the 1961 brown face Princeton and the silver face Fender Champ. Jack and Ollie and I really want to thank all our viewers, subscribers, and especially our Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors for keeping us on the air for another month. If you would like to make a contribution in support of our advertising free uh, video channel, uh, I'll put some links in the video description to help you to do so. Meanwhile, I hope you're having a really great new year and that you'll stay tuned because we have two or three more videos in production uh, that should be out soon. We'll see you then.